Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, and you can think of me as your friendly guide to the English language. Writing, history, rules, and cool stuff. Today, I have two cool segments. First, we'll talk about being bilingual and how it can change your perception of time. And second, we'll talk about the languages of Star Wars. But first, today's episode is supported by the Waterpick Whitening Water Flosser. If you drink coffee, tea, or red wine, it can be hard to keep your teeth stain-free. But it takes just one minute a day to restore whiter teeth and a cleaner, healthier mouth with the Waterpick Whitening Water Flosser. It removes 25% more stains than brushing alone. Get $30 off a Waterpick Whitening Water Flosser for yourself at waterpick.com slash grammar and enter the code grammar. That's waterpick.com slash grammar and the code grammar. This next segment is by Panos Athanasopoulos. It turns out Hollywood got it half right. In the film Arrival, Amy Adams plays linguist Louise Banks, who's trying to decipher an alien language. She discovers the way the aliens talk about time gives them power to see into the future. So as Banks learns their language, she also begins to see through time. As one character in the movie says, learning a foreign language rewires your brain. My new study, which I worked on with linguist Emmanuel Byland, shows that bilinguals do indeed think about time differently, depending on the language context in which they're estimating the duration of events. But unlike Hollywood, bilinguals sadly can't see into the future. However, this study does show that learning a new way to talk about time really does rewire the brain. Our findings are the first psychophysical evidence of cognitive flexibility in bilinguals. We've known for some time that bilinguals go back and forth between their languages rapidly and often unconsciously, a phenomenon called code switching. But different languages also embody different worldviews in different ways of organizing the world around us. The way that bilinguals handle these different ways of thinking has long been a mystery to language researchers. Time is a case in point. Time is fascinating because it's very abstract. We can't touch or see it, but we organize our whole lives around it. The really cool thing about time is the way we actually experience it is in some ways up to our imagination and our language. Because time is so abstract, the only way to talk about it is by using the terminology from another, more concrete domain of experience, namely that of space. For example, in Swedish, the word for future is framtid, which literally means front time. Visualizing the future as in front of us and the past behind us is also very common in English. We look forward to the good times ahead and to leaving the past behind us. But for speakers of Aymara spoken in Peru, looking ahead means looking at the past. The word for future means behind time. So the spatial axis is reversed. The future is behind and the past is ahead. The logic in Aymara appears to be this. We can't look into the future just like we can't see behind us. The past is already known to us. We can see it just like anything else that appears in our field of vision in front of us. These differences in how time is visualized in the mind affect how Aymara speakers gesture about events. Those that are bilingual in Spanish, a future in front language like English, tend to make forward-moving gestures, whereas those with little or no knowledge of Spanish gesture backward when talking about the future, consistent with the Aymara future-is-behind pattern. Mandarin Chinese employs a vertical time axis alongside a horizontal one. The word for down is used to talk about future events, so when referring to next week, a Mandarin Chinese speaker would literally say down week. The word for up is used to talk about the past, so last week becomes up one week. This affects the way observers perceive the spatial unfolding of the aging process. In one study, Chinese-English bilinguals were asked to arrange pictures of a young, mature, and old Brad Pitt and Jet Li. 
They arranged the former horizontally with the young Brad Pitt to the left and the old Brad Pitt to the right. But the same people arranged the pictures of Jet Li vertically, with young Jet Li appearing at the top and old Jet Li appearing at the bottom. It seems that culture and meaning form a tight bond as this context-dependent shift in behavior shows. Our study showed that these language differences have psychophysical effects in the bilingual mind. They alter the way the same individual experiences the passage of time, depending on the language context they're operating in. For example, Swedish and English speakers prefer to mark the duration of events by referring to physical distances, a short break, a long party. But Greek and Spanish speakers tend to mark time by referring to physical quantities, a small break, a big party. Speakers of English and Swedish see time as a horizontal line, a distance traveled. But Spanish and Greek speakers see it as a quantity, a volume taking up space. As a consequence, English and Swedish monolinguals estimate how much time it takes for lines to lengthen across a computer screen based on how far the lines expand. If two lines stretch to different lengths over the same period, participants judge the shorter line to have traveled for less time than it actually did, and the longer line to have traveled for more time than it actually did. Spanish and Greek monolinguals, on the other hand, are affected in their time estimations by physical quantity, how much a container has filled with liquid. If two containers fill up to different levels over the same time period, participants judge the container with a smaller amount to have filled in less time than it actually did, and vice versa. But Spanish-Swedish bilinguals are flexible. When prompted with the Swedish word for duration, they estimated time using line length. They were unaffected by container volume. When prompted with the Spanish word for duration, they estimated time based on container volume. They were unaffected by line length. It seems that by learning a new language, you suddenly become attuned to perceptual dimensions that you weren't aware of before. The fact that bilinguals go between these different ways of estimating time effortlessly and unconsciously fits in with a growing body of evidence demonstrating the ease with which language can creep into our most basic senses, including our emotions, our visual perception, and now it turns out, our sense of time. But it also shows that bilinguals are more flexible thinkers— And there's evidence to suggest that mentally going back and forth between different languages on a daily basis confers advantages on the ability to learn and multitask and even long-term benefits for mental well-being. So to refer back, or is it forward, to arrival, it's never too late to learn a second language. You won't see into the future, but you'll definitely see things differently. That segment was written by Panos Athanasopoulos, who's a professor of linguistics and English language at Lancaster University. It was originally published on The Conversation and is included here through a Creative Commons license. Today's episode is brought to you by Hallmark Cards. The holidays can get hectic, and I don't even do a lot of decorating, but when I start to feel overwhelmed, I think about the important people in my life and how that's what it's all about. And I sit down with my favorite pen and a stack of Hallmark cards, and I start writing. I send them love for the year ahead, and I let them know how glad I am that they're part of my life, even if they live far away. And I know that when a Hallmark card arrives in the mailbox, it'll brighten their day. And that's the best feeling of all. You just have to remind yourself of it sometimes. So give it a try and see what a card can do. Visit hallmark.com slash grammar to shop holiday cards for everyone on your list. And use the promo code grammar to get 20% off your card purchase. Today's show is also sponsored by Teach for America. You won't be surprised to hear that I believe in the power of education. We should all have the opportunity to learn from a dedicated, passionate teacher who breaks things down in clear, comprehensible language. But I know that today, many students suffer because they don't have access to a great education. 
And that's one of the reasons I find Teach for America so inspiring. TFA lets college graduates and professionals make an immediate, powerful difference in the lives of students across the country. There are so many stories of leaders who've gone through TFA using their experience, skills, creativity, and passion to champion the kids they teach, all while growing as a professional and as a person. To learn more about how you can join this network of 60,000 leaders who've helped redefine the future for kids in the classroom and beyond, visit teachforamerica.org slash grammargirl today, and you'll also get a free guide on how to pursue a purpose-driven career. That's teachforamerica.org slash grammargirl. This fall saw the debut of the Star Wars series, The Mandalorian, and in just a few days, The Rise of Skywalker hits the big screen. With that in mind, today we're going to talk about the languages spoken in the Star Wars universe. 68 different languages have been featured so far in the various movies, TV shows, comics, and books. And in the original Star Wars movie, C-3PO says that he is, quote, fluent in over six million forms of communication. Unquote. That's too much for us to cover today, and we know not all of you are Star Wars fans, so we'll talk briefly about a few of the top languages from this world and a few fun facts about each. Let's talk first about the languages spoken by the fuzzy folks of this galaxy, the Wookiees and the Ewoks. By the way, careful spellers will note that Wookiee is spelled W-O-O-K-I-E-E, that's two E's on the end. Wookiees speak three different languages. Chewbacca speaks Shiriwook, the most common language of the Wookiees. The other two dialects are Thikaran and Soxic. All of them sound like a combination of howls and growls. Wookiees come from a heavily wooded planet, and they are expert woodcarvers. For that reason, their language supposedly has 150 different words for wood. Ewoks are the more petite fuzzy species of this universe. They're native to the moon of Endor, and their technology and language are both simple. They use spears and slings as weapons, and C-3PO notes in Return of the Jedi that they speak a very primitive dialect. So primitive that he talks with them using a different language, Yuzum, also native to Endor. Even though 3PO was a protocol droid, apparently Ewokese was too rudimentary to include in his programming. The sound designer for Ewokese, Ben Burt, developed the sound of the language by recording speakers from Inner Mongolia, Tibet, Sri Lanka, and India. He chose elements from all of them, weaving them together in a way that evoked the playfulness of the Ewok people. Let's move on to droids. Droids play a huge role in the Star Wars ecosystem, and they speak many tongues. R2-D2 whistles and squeals in something called astromech binary. BB-8 uses a more advanced form, 27th generation droid speak. Imperial probe droids use omnisignal unicode. And some very simple droids, the ones that look like walking trash cans, speak Gonkian, in which the word gonk plays a huge role. Many of the bad guys in this universe also have their own languages. Boba and Jango Fett use the Fett code. Death Troopers, a particularly nasty type of stormtrooper, has an encryption code. And Jabba and the other Huts spoke Huttese, based on Quechua, a real language spoken in South America. Jabba's sound was particularly unique. His laugh was created by combining the sounds of humans, hippos, and hyenas. His slimy sound effects were based on the sound of macaroni and cheese being smushed around in a bowl. The big bad guys, Darth Vader, Kylo Ren, Supreme Leader Snope, all speak Galactic Basic. That's a common language spoken across the galaxy. Some races, like Wookiees, can't speak basic because of the nature of their vocal cords, but most everyone can understand it. One final point. We've talked before about languages like Dothraki, which was used in the Game of Thrones TV series, and Klingon from the Star Trek universe. Both of those are constructed languages, conlangs for short. They're made up, but they have a rich vocabulary, elaborate rules of grammar, and a logic behind how their words are constructed. 
In contrast, the languages invented for Star Wars have never had broad vocabularies or official grammars. They're more like systems of sounds, imagined versions of what aliens might sound like when they speak. Like Iwakis, they've often been based on the sound systems of real languages, or even on the particular way a certain person speaks. Does that make them less real than a conlang? Maybe, but don't tell that to a Star Wars fan. You might just get a gleeg thrown in your face. That's Ewok for a drink. That segment was written by Samantha Enslin, who runs Dragonfly Editorial. You can find her at dragonflyeditorial.com or on Twitter as Dragonfly Edit. Finally, I have a voicemail that was refreshing because it's from somebody who likes the sound of a word instead of hating the sound of a word. I could use a little positivity in my life every once in a while. Hi, Mignon. This is Larry from California. I've been enjoying your podcast for many years. I enjoyed your segment on word aversion. And I don't have any words that I can think of that I'm averse to, but I do have a word, actually a name, that I really do like. There was an Italian Renaissance artist. His name was Gerland Dio. And I often find myself just saying that word again and again, just out of the blue, not even thinking of Italy or Renaissance or art or anything. I think it has something to do with the fact that the word just sort of starts with the G sound at the back of your mouth and ends with the O in the front. It sort of rolls from back to front. Anyway, I thought you'd find that somewhat interesting, and I look forward to many more years of your podcast. Bye-bye. Thank you, Larry. I looked up the artist, and his full name is Domenico Gerlandio. He lived in Italy in the 1400s, and Encyclopedia Britannica says he was known for his, quote, detailed narrative frescoes, which include many portraits of leading citizens in contemporary dress, unquote and that the Vatican hired him to paint a fresco in the Sistine Chapel. If you want to share your family dialect story, the story of a word your family and only your family uses, leave a voicemail at 83-321-4-GIRL, and you might hear it on the show. And be sure to tell me the story behind it, because that's always the best part. I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl. You can find me at the home of my podcast network, quickanddirtytips.com. Thank you to my producer, Nathan Sams, and that's all. Thanks for listening. Yeah.